Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at National Instruments with Jeff Phillips. He's going to talk today about the new challenges in testing of autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles. So Jeff, we've seen a lot of changes coming into this market. Uh, the technology that we're, we're talking about didn't even exist several years ago, let alone a year ago. How do you adapt test to that? Yeah, th this is one of the big challenges that, that that's driving uh, the race to, to the market in, in automotive. And you mentioned the, the technology that hasn't didn't even exist a few years ago. You know, there's software in every component of the car. There are sensors all over the perimeter of the car now helping it make decisions. Really, the how we go about keeping pace with it is that we have to build flexibility into the test platform that's moving with the car and the car subsystems through the life cycle. Now, traditionally, the automotive market with long life cycles was marked by really sophisticated, custom-built systems. I want to test this uh, uh, power-breaking system. I'm going to build a test system specifically to the I.O. components and needs of that system, and that will live for 12 months or 18 months down the line. Today, the components of these systems are changing every week or changing every month, and the flexibility to change the behavior, change the I.O. in the system is really critical. And it also changes by geography too, right? So China doesn't want all the data sitting in the car. Europe wants to control the privacy of the data. The United States is completely different. Yeah, absolutely. And data, and where does the data go? Who owns the data? Is it the driver? Is it the car manufacturer? That is a critical issue that's challenging really the future of where the car market is going and the different players that are providing the components of it. You know, you mentioned in Europe, uh, where really where Germany is, is the center of that market, the privacy laws in, Germ in Europe are really challenging the, the, the value of those systems uh, across the car and across the different geographies. China is its own little mecca in the middle of Asia, and then of course you've got Japan and Korea. And the, the markets in Asia are more similar to the markets here in the U.S. with privacy laws and the expectation of what we can do with that data. Why don't you draw some of those out for us? Sure. So where do you see the biggest challenges? What are you trying to test here? Now, in autonomous driving, the biggest challenge comes down to verifying that the perception algorithms in the car see and perceive the world around it accurately and then make the appropriate decision about what to do or, or where to drive the car. Now, one of the uh, technologies that we're expecting to have a big impact on this is communications. Now, the 3GPP committee, which is a, a cellular standards body that helps define a lot of the, the communication standards, recently re uh, had a release that talked about uh, 5G applications within automotive. Now, the, the value here in having communications between the cars isn't necessarily in communicating what I'm doing or where I'm going, but in the intent of what I'm about to do. Now, one of the most complicated scenarios that we look at is the left-hand turn across traffic. So here we have a car that's about to make a left-hand turn, potentially across traffic coming from the opposite direction, and then also having to take into account uh, cross traffic. Now, for this car to be able to communicate, I'm about to turn left, provides value to the car coming up behind it, where instead of this car just seeing the brake lights or perceiving a change in speed, can anticipate that and have extra time to make the appropriate decision. Cars coming down this path could potentially slow down, uh, even, on a, even on a small scale from 40 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour to let this car path let this car pass, and it also helps traffic in all these different directions, just being able to communicate the intent of, of what we can do. So when you're testing this, how much of the infrastructure is in the car, that's what you're worried about, and that's what you're testing, versus the infrastructure that's outside of the car? So primarily, what we're talking about is testing the AV, or the compute platform that's inside of the car. And so that's a combination of the sensors, that live around the perimeter of the car, so there's generally radar sensors, LIDAR, ultrasonic. And then it's the software algorithm running on the compute platform that brings all of that information together and determines if this thing that we see out across the road is a bike, a tree, a dog, or maybe a motorcycle, and then determining based on a series of models what that object is most likely to do and then testing the algorithm that provides the padding for the car. 
So once we've seen the world, now we need to determine, is it okay to go ahead and turn left, or do we need to sit here and wait for a safer time? And the computing platform that lives inside of the car is a combination of those sensors, and then all the processor uh, and data storage that lives in that compute platform itself. And that's primarily what we're talking about testing uh, when we're talking about autonomous and semi-autonomous applications. There's also different technologies that are, that are involved in basically understanding where you are in the context of other vehicles. How do you go about doing that, and does it change from one place to another? It definitely changes from one place to another. The, we, we've, we've talked about cellular Vita X, or the cellular LTE-based implementation of a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, but that's not the only one. More commonly used, if we look backwards, is DSRC, or direct short-range communication, which is more about, I'm just going to broadcast information out into the world, and whoever is there to hear it can hear it. But I don't, I don't need a confirmation that you heard it. I don't need any, any type of communication back. It's just a, a one-way communication out from the different cars. A lot of the information that the car will get from other cars communicating to it we can test that inside of, the, inside of the process to test the car by treating it like any other input from a sensor. So you have to test that the antenna is accurately getting the information it was supposed to get. And then there's the, does the algorithm running on the compute platform make the appropriate decision based on that data? And so we can test that a lot like we would test a radar sensor or a LIDAR sensor by treating it as another input. Does it have to be tested in the context of other vehicles as well? So for example, if you're developing a system and it may not be exactly the same as another system, what happens there? It doesn't necessarily have to be tested within the context of that because to an individual car, everything else in the world around it, whether it's built on the same platform or is communicating speed in kilometers per hour versus miles per hour, is another object in the field that it needs to avoid. And by the time we get into the, into the hardware and software running on the car, everything else is just an input. And it, it's not as critical if what platform that car is running on or what communications protocol it used to communicate by the time we get inside of the, inside of the car and the compute platform itself. So where do you see the big challenges developing here? The big challenge is there's no known right answer. In the traditional test sense, you provide a set of inputs to a system that you know what the outputs are going to be, and then you compare those and say, oh, we, we passed the test. In these autonomous applications, there isn't necessarily a right answer. What we're doing is we're testing that we probably made the right answer based on the inputs that were given. And so really the biggest challenge we're facing is the lack of standardization, the lack of a coherent, cohesive decision making about how we're going to treat specific scenarios in autonomy applications. And there are a handful of common scenarios that come up. You have the, the single lane car sitting behind a UPS truck, and is it allowed to cross the yellow line in order to pass it? Because that would constitute violating a traffic law, which is one of the core laws that drives the behavior of the car. So really what you're doing is coming up with a distribution of acceptable behavior, right? Yeah, and not just a distribution, but a probabilistic distribution of accepted behavior. So what you want to be able to do on this stuff is not just know what's in front of you, you also want to be able to predict what other things will happen before you make that turn, right? Yeah. Not only what's in front of you, but what environment does that car see because you're about to get to that same environment and so the more you can be told what's going to be there versus have to determine or sense and and do the the, the hard de the determination to figure out what it is and then where is the car planning to go and on what time scale cost has always been a, a key part of this uh it's been a part of semiconductors but it's also particularly a part of the automotive industry uh, they're very, very sensitive to price increases because all the stuff has to be affordable. The problem is that you add more test time, you add more complexity, you add more uh, sensors and uh, electronics into a car, and suddenly the cost goes up. You have to bring that down. How do you manage all those pieces? Now, cost is a pretty interesting conversation when it comes to autonomous cars because the entire ROI model changes 
when you're talking about an autonomous car. So imagine you're buying a car that's going to be fully autonomous and will drive you to work, park itself in the garage, pick you back up, and drive you home. That car is still only being utilized like 80% of the time, 90% of the time. And the majority of the time, it's sitting in the garage at work, or sitting in your garage at home. Now, for an, an autonomous fleet, so imagine an Uber deploying a fleet in the city, their cost model is going to look a lot different. One, because their cars are going to be used all the time. And two, because the traditional careabouts of a consumer, like what does the car look like, uh, how, you know, what color is it, is there a big ugly LiDAR sensor sitting on top of it, when you're taking a car as a service or transportation as a service, a lot of those types of characteristics change. Now, when you look at autonomous cars as they roll out uh, in the future, that will also change the cost model because Again, you're not owning the car, you're treating transportation more as a service. And so one of the reasons we expect autonomous cars to start to come to market first in fleets and in smaller cities more as a transportation as a service provider is because of that cost model. Because we're, we're struggling with the how expensive and hard the technology is, but how you need those high power processing requirements. You need a lot of heat dissipation uh, in order to keep the energy levels of the car safe and, and those do cost money, and a lot of the models that we're looking at for AVs don't make sense for a broad consumer yet. Do the technologies that you develop here carry over into other markets as well? So think like robotics. Um, will the, the tests that you're doing here apply there as well? Oh, absolutely. And there are uh, adjacencies in the market, even within the EV, the electrical powertrain. You know, we're starting to hear a lot of the aerospace providers, a lot of the long haul trains, off highway uh, roads, even construction equipment developers are starting to pull in the technology from these platforms uh, in order to make better decisions. And a lot of those applications are better test beds because they're safer. As an example, one of the companies that we know of is taking autonomous vehicles and looking at an application within construction sites. So they found that the, the biggest loss of money is the availability of the materials. So they're developing uh, a machine that can move materials around the construction site and have them available according to a schedule of when they're needed. And that type of application is at a lower speed. There's a lot less people and vehicles around the car to test the application and the algorithm itself. And there's a lot of uh, adjacencies uh, around the, the, both the electrical powertrain and then the autonomy application. Jeff Phillips, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Absolutely. Thank you.